Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. And today's topic of discussion is fluid velocity and fluid power. Our objective is to examine how a conductor's cross-sectional area and flow rate through it influences fluid velocity and how pressure and flow rate influence fluid power. Let us begin our discussion with a metaphorical mountain climbing expedition. When attempting to summit this mountain, you may be presented with opportunities for additional exploration, be it some unusually scenic overlook or some radical waterfall just off the path. Though these entertaining diversions do not directly contribute to the larger goal of summiting the mountain, they do contribute to the larger context of the mountain and the journey itself. They are in their own right, entertaining. Such is the intention of this lecture. It is to be considered an entertaining side diversion contributing to the larger contextual understanding of hydraulics and not meant to be a tedious bushwhack through thorns. In the interest of expediency, I'm going to kind of blow through the math with the understanding that if you want to bushwhack through these mathematical thorns, this option is available. The larger points of this lecture are quite simple. Flow rate, conductor diameter, and fluid velocity are related quantities as are pressure, flow rate, and fluid power. Let's begin with a discussion of fluid velocity. Fluid velocity is quite simply the speed of an individual particle of oil through a conduit, be that conduit a pipe, tube, hose, or passage inside a valve or manifold. Individual oil particles can be thought of as tiny, tiny bullets shot down the length of the conductor, each having their own speed, direction, mass, inertia, and level of cohesion to the wall of the conduit and to their neighbors also traveling with a given velocity. Given ideal conditions, those particles in contact with the interior wall of a straight length of conductor will be subject to more friction and as a result move slower than those in the center. This leads to a velocity profile such that the thin layer of fluid adhering to the stationary surface is creeping along. As we move into the center, velocity increases. This type of smooth layered flow is known as laminar flow. Laminar means sheet-like in that each layer of fluid has its own velocity and they do not interfere with one another. Fluid power systems are ordinarily designed such that conduits are properly sized to accommodate the required flow rate such that flow remains laminar. Beyond a certain fluid velocity transition point, flow becomes turbulent. Turbulent flow is characterized by a chaotic churning action. Turbulent flow is inefficient and is to be generally avoided. Systems experiencing turbulent flow might run unusually hot and as such exhibit early thermal breakdown of the oil. The velocity at which flow ceases to be laminar and becomes turbulent is yet another exciting diversion called the Reynolds number which I do not intend to pursue within this lecture. However, suffice it to say that it depends upon the properties of the fluid being utilized, specifically the velocity and kinematic viscosity, a similar sounding term that is a measure of a liquid's resistance to flow. Returning our attention to a laminar flow condition, we can calculate the average velocity of the velocity profile using the simple relationship of velocity equals flow rate over area. Note velocity is often signified as a small v rather than a large v which is customarily reserved for signifying volume. To avoid the confusion between these related formulas, I suggest explicitly spelling it out as velocity equals flow rate over area. At first glance, this formula may seem self-evident, but I must caution you that details, notably units, are extremely important considerations. A cursory analysis of this relationship suggests that when flow rate is held constant and we increase the cross-sectional area, the velocity decreases. This makes perfect sense. Consider a tunnel full of commuters on their way to a subway. Given 100 people per minute entering a super wide tunnel, people in the tunnel can take their time and stroll quite leisurely given the tunnel is wide enough to accommodate this quantity of people per minute. This would be a laminar flow condition with hurried commuters purposely traveling the center relatively unmolested by the slow moving beggars and buskers lingering by the walls. Similarly, if flow rate is held constant, if we decrease the cross-sectional area, velocity increases. This again makes perfect sense, given the tunnel isn't really wide enough to accommodate this quantity of people per minute. This would be a turbulent flow condition with every person in the tunnel kicking, clawing, punching, pushing, and crawling over each other's backs to make it to the train on time. Coming at this from the opposite end, a rearrangement of this relationship suggests that flow rate is velocity times area, which again makes perfect sense. When cross-sectional area is held constant and we increase velocity, flow rate increases. 
Conversely, when cross-sectional air is held constant, if we decrease velocity, flow rate decreases. Sticking with our earlier analogy, given a tunnel filled with Olympic sprinters at full sprint versus the same tunnel filled with slow-moving pedestrians trying to text message each other, we'd expect more sprinters per minute to emerge than slow-moving pedestrians. Let's turn our attention away from the general concept and towards the specific units these quantities are customarily expressed. Flow rate, if you recall, is a measure of volume per unit time, volume itself being a cube of a distance unit. Cross-sectional area is a square of a distance unit. Velocity, therefore, is a measure of distance per unit time. Mathematically, our first relationship suggests that velocity is equal to flow rate divided by area. Distance cubed per unit time divided by distance squared, units of distance squared cancel out, and we're left with a unit of distance per time. Thus far, our relationship seems to be in perfect working order. The problem is that very rarely are compatible units employed for these different quantities. Flow rate is often expressed in units of gallons per minute or liters per minute, and conduit cross-sectional area is often an implied product of a conduit's diameter. Further complicating this dilemma is the fact that fluid velocity may be expressed in units of foot per second, inches per second, meters per second, or some other equally unwieldy choice. This is to suggest that obtaining this scenic diversion, seemingly just off the path, necessitates a little bit of wallowing in the mathematical blackberries. Allow me to demonstrate. Follow along if you wish. Consider a pipe with a half inch internal diameter carrying 1.2 gallons per minute. We're being asked to calculate the fluid velocity in units of feet per second. Let's start by calculating the cross-sectional area. A conduit with a half-inch diameter has a cross-sectional area of approximately 0.1963 square inches. Now let's perform a necessary unit conversion. A flow rate of 1.2 gallons per minute is 277.2 cubic inches per minute, or approximately 4.62 cubic inches per second. Substituting these values into our fluid velocity formula suggests that fluid velocity is approximately 23.5 inches per second. Performing the necessary unit conversion yields a fluid velocity of approximately 1.96 or roughly 2 feet per second. This is a pretty acceptable velocity figure and which will most likely result in laminar flow conditions. Depending upon the application, most manufacturers recommend keeping fluid velocity below 15 feet per second between a pump and an actuator below 4 feet per second in a pump suction line, and below 8 feet per second in a return line. This explains why suction and return lines are often larger in diameter than working lines to keep fluid velocity below these figures. Keeping with this spirit, let's say a manufacturer is specifically requesting a system must keep velocity below, let's say, 10 feet per second. However, must accommodate an astronomical flow rate of 64 gallons per minute. See if you can use your understanding to determine the minimum diameter of conduit necessary to meet these requirements. Here's a hint. It's going to be huge, given this astronomically large flow rate. Let's say the following sizes of conduit are commercially available. Half inch, inch, inch and a half, two inches, and three inch internal diameter. Let's perform some necessary unit conversions. 10 feet per second, is 120 inches per second. 64 gallons per minute is 14,784 cubic inches per minute, or approximately 246.4 cubic inches per second, almost a gallon a second. Like I said, this is a lot of flow. Rearranging our relationship suggests that area is equal to flow rate over velocity. Substituting in the necessary values, yields a cross-sectional area of approximately 2.05 square inches. Solving for diameter, or diameter equals the square root of 4a over pi, yields approximately 1.6 inches. Given pipe of this exact diameter is not commercially available, you'd be stuck with buying the next size up. In this case, two inch internal diameter does the trick quite nicely. Given the commercially available two inch internal diameter pipe is substantially oversized for our required flow rate, we'd expect the fluid velocity to be much less than the permitted maximum of 10 feet per second. Since we've got the numbers right in front of us, our calculations now suggest that the resultant velocity should be around 78.4 inches per second 
or approximately 6.5 feet per second. This is most definitely a laminar flow condition given this manufacturer suggests keeping fluid velocity below 10 feet per second. Realize even in the most ideal of laminar flow conditions, isolated pockets of turbulence will always develop at the inevitable turn, restriction, kink, bend, fitting, or valve passage. Going back to my earlier depiction of flow as individual particles, each having their own velocity, it is for very obvious reasons turns are most efficient when they perform gradual sweeping bends. Any particle with a characteristic inertia negotiating a sharp turn or obstruction would slam into the corner and bounce around the bend, contributing to turbulence and inefficient operation of the system. Often manufacturers specify a certain minimum bend radii that a hose must negotiate. For example, consider a hose manufacturer that specifies a hose with a six times internal diameter minimum bend radius. This means a hose with a half inch internal diameter could at most negotiate a three inch radius or a six inch diameter circle without being unduly inefficient. We'll examine other conduit characteristics in later lectures. Moving on, let's now examine how pressure and flow rate influence fluid power. It should be well within your capacity to understand that power is the time rate expenditure or production of energy. Power is energy over time. Depending upon the system of units employed, customarily power is expressed in units of foot-pounds force per second, units of horsepower, or watts, where one watt is one joule per second. Energy, in contrast, is commonly expressed as force times distance. Common units of energy are foot-pounds force and joules, where one joule is one newton of force expressed a distance of one meter. There are several perspectives one can use when calculating power, one being the output mechanical power of the system, the other being the input fluid power. On a simplistic level, calculating output mechanical power of a system requires knowledge of the force exerted, the distance traveled, and the time required to do so. Given 2,400 pound weight lifted 12 inches in five seconds, we can calculate that the mechanical power exerted is approximately 480 foot-pounds force per second. If we needed to express this in units of horsepower, it would be roughly equivalent to 0.872 horsepower, or in units of watts, approximately 651.1 watts. If one, however, was only capable of observing the fluid properties, namely pressure and flow rate, one would have to go through a tedious series of calculations to arrive at this value. Allow me to demonstrate. Assuming we're using a cylinder with a two inch cap diameter, a half inch rod diameter, with a travel length of 12 inches that lifts on extension, we would expect to observe the following functional areas and volumes. The cap end functional area is approximately 3.14 square inches. The volume of the cap at full extension is approximately 37.7 cubic inches. Assuming this cylinder lifted a 2,400 pound object on extension using the cap end functional area, we can use Pascal's law to calculate that this cylinder would necessitate an input pressure of at least 763.9 psi. Given the cap end volume of approximately 37.7 cubic inches must be filled in 5 seconds to fully extend the load, we can use our knowledge of flow rate and actuator speed to calculate this cylinder would necessitate a flow rate at least 7.54 cubic inches per second, or approximately 1.96 gallons per minute. Now, if one was only capable of observing pressure and flow rate, rather than the observed force distance and time, one would have to perform the above calculations in reverse to see how this system would respond. This is an option. However, a shortcut exists, which I'll demonstrate now. If power is to be expressed in units of horsepower, flow expressed in units of gallons per minute, and pressure expressed in units of PSI, one can directly calculate hydraulic power as pressure times flow rate divided by the constant 1714. I'll explain the origin of the constant in a moment. Substituting in the observed pressure and flow rate, we arrive at 0.872 horsepower. Exactly as previously, and without the messy necessity of calculating functional area, volume, or actuation time. What is this magic, you say? I can assure you that pulling units of horsepower from PSI and GPM stew isn't magic, but rather math magic. The mysterious constant 1714 is a result of a string of unit conversion that takes some time to wade through to understand its origin. Pressure is expressed in units of PSI, 
or more understandably, pounds force per square inch. Flow rate is expressed in gallons per minute, or more simply, one gallon over one minute. Given a gallon is 231 cubic inches and one minute is 60 seconds, units of square inches cancel out and we're left with 231 over 60 pounds force inches per second. You can see where this is going, right? Given one foot is 12 inches, we can express this as 231 over 60 times 12 foot pounds force per second, which if you recall is a base unit of power. Given we need to express this power value in horsepower, along comes another unit conversion. Given one horsepower is 550 foot-pounds force per second, we can express this as 231 over 60 times 12 times 550. What is 231 over 60 times 12 times 550? To be relatively precise, it's 0.000583. However, it's customarily expressed as 1 over 1714. Ta-da! Pressure in units of PSI times flow rate in units of gallons per minute divided by 1714 yields power in units of horsepower. Do not think I am asking you to memorize this unit conversion mess. All you need to be able to do is put pressure and flow rate and power in the proper units and use this formula. Allow me to demonstrate the utility of this hydraulic power shortcut one more time in the manner it would be traditionally employed rather than the back calculation as I did previously. First, let's do it the hard way and pretend no shortcut exists. Given a cylinder with an inch and a half cap diameter, a half inch rod diameter, and a travel length of 16 inches that lifts on extension, we would expect to observe the following functional areas and volumes. Area of the cap is approximately 1.767 square inches, and the volume of the cap end at full extension is approximately 28.3 cubic inches. In the act of extension, let's say we're observing a pressure of approximately 600 psi and a flow rate of 1.3 gallons per minute. Again, we are going to do it the hard way first, no shortcut, but a rather good old fashioned mathematical ground pound. Let's start with a brief unit conversion. 16 inches is approximately 1.33 feet. And a flow rate of 1.3 gallons per minute is 300.3 cubic inches per minute, or approximately 5.005 cubic inches per second. Given the cap end functional area lifts on extension, we can use Pascal's law to calculate that this cylinder would exert an extension force of approximately 1,060.3 pound force. Given a flow rate of 1.3 gallons per minute, roughly 5.005 cubic inches per second, we can use our knowledge of flow rate and actuator speed to calculate that this cylinder would fully extend in roughly 5.65 seconds. Now all we have to do is put it together to arrive at a power figure. The force of 1060.3 pounds force was exerted a distance of 16 inches or approximately 1.33 feet over a time span of 5.65 seconds. This results in a power expression 250.25 foot-pounds force per second. If we wanted to express this in units of horsepower, we'd have to do a unit conversion to show this is roughly equal to 0.455 horsepower. Look at all the work it took to get here. Now let's try the shortcut. Given an observed pressure of 600 psi and a flow rate of 1.3 gallons per minute, we substitute these values into our shortcut power formula find this system is exerting 0.455 horsepower. Ta-da! Look at all the steps and time we saved. Using the shortcut, one does not need to know actuator dimensions, functional area, volume, Pascal's law, nor actuation time. One simply looks at observed pressure and flow rate and walks away with a fluid power figure. Now realize this simple example is assuming there is 100% efficiency, an obvious fallacy. Given an actuator is a fluid power to mechanical power converter, one can assume only a portion of fluid power input actually gets converted into usable mechanical power, the rest being lost to inefficiencies like leaks, friction, heat, or noise. Assuming we really are exerting 1060.3 pounds force, a distance of 16 inches, or approximately 1.33 feet, over approximately 5.65 seconds, we are definitely observing 250.25 foot-pounds force per second, or approximately 0.455 horsepower output. 
However, let's say we're observing an input pressure of 650 psi and a flow rate of 1.4 gallons per minute. Our shortcut fluid power calculation yields an input of approximately 0.53 horsepower. Given the actuator is applied 0.53 horsepower and exerts only 0.455 horsepower, we can therefore say that this actuator is approximately 85.7% efficient. Before closing this lecture, I should briefly mention constant horsepower applications in which flow and pressure are regulated, such as the title implies, power is constant. Given a constant power output and either a pressure or flow figure, you should be capable of solving for the unknown flow or pressure figure. Allow me to demonstrate. Given a constant two horsepower system, producing 10 gallons per minute of flow, determine the pressure. An algebraic rearrangement of our hydraulic power formula suggests that pressure equals 1714 times hydraulic power divided by flow rate. Substituting in the given values yields a pressure of approximately 342.8 psi. Similarly, if pressure increased to 2000 psi, we could rearrange our hydraulic power formula to solve for flow. Substituting in the given values, we find flow has decreased to roughly 1.7 gallons per minute. You note when flow output is plotted as a function of pressure requirement for a constant horsepower application, it forms a rather uniquely identifiable curve. At any point on this curve, the product of pressure and flow yields a constant power output, in this case our given value of 2 horsepower. As one would expect, if power is constant, flow rate is high when pressure requirement is relatively low. Similarly, flow rate is low when pressure requirement is high. It makes sense. And if you understand how pressure, flow, and hydraulic power are related, it can't not make sense. For those interested in testing their understanding of the above concepts, I'll leave you with the following challenge problems. I'll try to put the answers in the information section associated with this video. Challenge 1. Given a conductor with a 3 quarter inch internal diameter carrying 4 gallons per minute, determine the fluid velocity in units of feet per second. Challenge 2. Given a hydraulic system supplying a pressure of 900 psi and a flow rate of 2.6 gallons per minute to an actuator, determine the hydraulic power input to the actuator in units of horsepower. Given the actuator lifts a 2,500 pound weight one foot over the span of five seconds, determine the mechanical power output in units of horsepower and the efficiency of this actuator. Challenge three. Finally, given a constant horsepower application with regulated 3.5 horsepower output, determine the flow at 200 PSI and again at 1500 PSI. All right, I believe I discussed what I intended to do regarding fluid velocity and fluid power calculations. Unit conversions, math and constant derivations aside, you should realize there is a relationship between fluid velocity, flow rate, and cross-sectional area, and fluid power, pressure, and flow rate. In conclusion, this lecture took a brief introductory look at fluid velocity and fluid power calculations. Additionally, we defined laminar and turbulent flow conditions. Finally, we briefly discussed constant horsepower applications. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.